I am delighted to be hosting over the next few days uh, our virtual wine tastings and meet the winemaker series, what I call our persons of interest, not because they're on the run from the police, but because they obviously know what they're talking about, uh, very competent and interesting people. So uh, today uh, we're going to be talking about the wines of Bompa in the Rhone Valley in the company of the terrifically handsome and entertaining Jean-Philippe Perrin. Uh, just a, a few guidelines for you. The presentation is going to take about uh, about 30 minutes. Uh, there will be a question and answer uh, period at the end. So if you would like just to keep your questions uh, until the end, you'll see there's a Q&R button at the bottom and we'll be delighted to answer any of your questions uh, when we get to that point. And if we don't have the chance to answer all the questions, uh, there will be an email link at the end so that any of you can email us and uh, we will follow up with emails to anything we haven't answered uh, during the session. So without uh, further ado, uh, let me introduce you to Jean-Philippe Perrin, uh, who is uh, Director of Winemaking for the Rhone Valley for Boisset, former winemaker at Bompard himself. Uh, and he's going to take us through the wines of Bompard today. Uh, Jean-Philippe, bonsoir, good evening uh, in France. Bonsoir, Arnil. Bonsoir à tous. Uh, I am uh, so really happy uh, to present to you uh, our fabulous uh, winery, which is uh, Bompa and uh, our wines. Uh, so my name is Jean-Philippe Perrin. Uh, I'm coming from uh, Champagne. Uh, I am uh, working in uh, the Rhone since uh, 20 years now and uh, since nine years uh, for Boisset family. Um, so I am, I am in charge of, uh, of the wines, of uh, the, the winemaking. And uh, since one year now, uh, I am in charge of uh, others' activities in others' region for Boisset family. And uh, this is why um, all the quality of uh, the Bompa wines are managed by uh, Jean-Luc Durand, uh, who is uh, uh, so our winemaker today of uh, Bompa. And um, Jean-Luc uh, works in the Rhone Valley since 20 years too, and uh, 20 years um, for the Boisset family. Um, Jean-Luc uh, is an oenologist. Uh, he has got a an, uh, an, uh, diploma of oenology from uh, Toulouse. Uh, but uh, so in this period, in this time, uh, we have got a lot of work in the vineyard. And uh, this is why Jean-Luc uh, cannot be here in my place present you the wines, but it's me. Uh, so now maybe uh, let's talk about uh, Bompa. What is Bompa? It's not only an, uh, a brown or a range of wines. Um, at first, uh, Bompa is an old uh, castle, an old monastery uh, from uh, 1318. This uh, castle uh, has been an, uh, a monastery for the Carthusian monks. Bompa is situated in the southeast part of uh, the Rhone Valley, near uh, the river Durance and the Rhone River. Um, Bompa, uh, due to the situation of uh, the Chartreuse, uh, the situation near the Durance River, uh, before that, uh, there was some monks there. It was in a very uh, dangerous passage uh, to cross the river. And it was called the Malus Passus in the Latin language. When the, when the Carthusian monks came in 1318, uh, they have secured uh, the, the passage of the river and it has become uh, so the Bonus Passus. Uh, which means the good cross, le bon passage. Yes, the name of safe the crossing, line. yes. The safe crossing, thank you, Neil. Yeah, yeah. So 1318 is an, uh, a date which is really important for us because uh, at this date, I can show you at the back of, uh, of the bottle, like that. In 1318, the Pope, John 22, who lived in Avignon at this period, has given the monastery to the Carthusian monks. And it has been done by a later 
have been a, a letter, yes, written by the Pope himself. And on this letter that we have seen uh, in Avignon, in the archives of Avignon, there was a, the crest of Bompa that we can have today, uh, which is the logo of, uh, of Bompa. Uh, and in this logo, yeah, exactly, we have got the original crest of La Maison uh, Notre Dame de Bompa with some elements which are coming from uh, the Carthusian Mount. This is important because uh, this is a uh, real uh, old uh, monument and history, and uh, they always had some vineyard around uh, this area and this region. We have to don't forget that the wines at first I have always been uh, planted and uh, vinified by, by the monks. So this is a real interesting uh, uh, history and uh, experience that we can see when we have the chance to visit the Chartreuse de Bompa uh, near Avignon. Very good. Thank you, Jean-Philippe. Um, perhaps before tasting the wines themselves, could you just uh, give a little refresher for anybody watching who may not know the Rhone in, uh, in any detail, uh, just a little overview of the Rhone Valley, how it's split up and, and how the appellations of the Rhone Valley are organized. Yeah, so uh, as you know, in France, um, the vineyard is uh, separated in the different uh, uh, big regions. The big regions are uh, uh, Loire Valley, uh, Bordeaux, uh, Provence, uh, Burgundy, Beaujolais, and Rhone Valley. The Rhone Valley, situated in the southeast east of France, all along the Rhone River, from Lyon to uh, Avignon, um, this uh, Rhone Valley region is uh, separated in uh, two sub-regions. At the north, we have got uh, so the appellations only some Cru, so Saint Joseph, Hermitage, Croix Hermitage, uh, Cotroti, Condrieux and some others. The particularity of the North is that this is some soils uh, which are more fresh compared to the South. This is why the only red grapes in the North of the Rhone is the Syrah. And we find the Syrah in the South too. In white, we have got Marsan, Roussan, and Vionnier. The South is the hottest yeah, the hottest uh, area, separated in different um, classification of appellation. So we are speaking only about uh, appellation d'origine contrôlée, which is a higher level in the range of the wine. Into the appellation d'origine contrôlée, we have got some appellations from the Rhone Valley. So Luberon, Ventoux, Grignan les Ademars, Duché d'Uzès, Costière de Nîmes, then uh, we will have the regional appellation, which is Côte du Rhône and Côte du Rhône village in the center of the south of the Rhône. Then we will have uh, the Cru. The Cru is a higher level of the appellation, with the most famous, which is Chateauneuf du Pape, or Gigondas, and Vaqueras, Rasto, Lirac, Tavel. Bopin has a in, in the, in, on the map, you can see that Bompa is just situated between Avignon and, uh, and, Cavagnon, and Cavaillon. The, the river that we can see in the south is the Durance River. The Rhône, the terroir of the Rhône, is characterized by the proximity of the river because we call it the Quaternary Terraces, which is a specific soil with some pebbles which are coming from the mountains, Les Alpes and La Durance, transported, carried, sorry, by, uh, by the river millions of uh, years ago. And this type of soil is uh, the, the, the better, yeah, the best soils and uh, for the Grenache. The Grenache uh, uh, loves this type of uh, pebbles with sands, with, uh, with red, red clay, and uh, the, old vines, the old vines of Grenache, uh, this is on this type of soil that they give the most uh, interesting uh, wines for us. 
So I have spoken about the proximity of Bompa and uh, the Durance River because Bompa is situated on this type of soils, uh, quaternary terraces, and all the wines that we have uh, are coming from this type of uh, terroir. And I have to precise that uh, uh, between Avignon, uh, Chateauneuf du Pape, uh, Bompa, and the Luberon, uh, this is certainly the most uh, hot region in France. So, concerning the maturation of uh, the grapes and uh, the balance of the wine, this is really due to this uh, special um, situation and climate. Very good. So uh, you mentioned uh, Grenache, uh, Jean-Philippe, of course, which is the king of the Southern Rhone uh, Valley grapes. Just a, a little word about the other grapes that uh, are typically used and the ones specifically you'll talk about the wines that, uh, that we use in our wines. Yeah. So yeah, we, we speak about Grenache because this is really the base of all our blends. Another particularity in the south of the Rhone is that due to the number of, dif of different grapes that we can use, um, we, we can really um, manage the different uh, typicity of appellation and, uh, and grape variety. The other grapes, um, except the Grenache, is the Syrah, Mourvèd, uh, then Carignan, Pinceau, uh, and some others. Uh, because we can, this is re not really no, but sometimes we can add into the tank during the harvest some white grapes with red grapes. The white grapes uh, are uh, Viognier or uh, Claret, Bourboulinque, uh, very specific and local uh, grapes uh, variety. Great. Okay, so shall we move into the tasting? And you can talk a little bit more about the varietals and the winemaking as we move our way through. Okay, um, maybe we can uh, show, uh, show the, the range uh, of our wines. Um, we have, uh, we, today we have got 16 uh, different uh, AOP wines into the range of uh, Bompa with only Two, um, two white wines, uh, the Côte du Rhône white and uh, the Luberon. Uh, Luberon is uh, one uh, which is very, uh, uh, one of the white wine, very interesting from the South because as I explained, the South is really, has gotten a really hot weather, uh, hot climate. And the problem with this sunshine is that we lose some uh, acidity during uh, the harvest. And it's not really the case in the Luberon, because uh, in Luberon there is a real influence from the mountains, uh, Les Alpes, uh, which uh, maintain an uh, interesting level of, uh, of acidity. Uh, for me, this is the key. When we, have, when we are situated in a, in a hot uh, area, the, the acidity is the key. In some other region, or maybe 30 years ago, we were searching uh, to the sugar. Today, to produce sugar uh, into the grapes, it's not the problem. The problem for me is the acidity. This is why uh, one our, uh, a part of our job with Jean-Luc is really to select uh, some specific area with a level of acidity and a good maturation. Each time in all our wines, what we really uh, search to do is to find in the female blend in the bottle, a level of balance, which could be really um, appreciated for a good conservation too. Right, so, well, I, I, can see, I can see you've got the, the bottles and the glasses, so we, we'll all watch you drink, uh, taste, sorry, and, and, and drool. And if anybody else is watching is lucky enough to have a have a bottle open and join Jean-Philippe as, as we go along, but in, enjoy your tasting, Jean-Philippe, and we will, we, we will enjoy yeah. through you. So go ahead. It, it shows that uh, I have begun the tasting uh, <clears throat> early, but you know in France, it's very late. So it was too much difficult for me to wait after you, sorry. So yes, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so 
without beginning with uh, the Luberon, la légende de Bonpas. Uh, so it's not so easy to to understand it uh, with this size of picture, but each wine has got his own own uh, his own story. Each appellation has got his own uh, link with a part of the story of the Chartreuse de Bonpas or with the place of the Chartreuse. This is why at first uh, I have tried to explain what is Bonpas and the place and the build because there is a real historical link between Bonpas and the appellation. So what is the link between the Luberon and Bonpas? This is the wall that we have. Uh, so I, I'm sorry because in English, I cannot explain what is this type of wall, but Neil will help me. Le mur à abeilles. Oh, a honeycomb, a honeycomb or like a, like a bee's nest, right? Yeah, exactly. And this wall uh, has got uh, um, uh, 30 different uh, bees house. Beehives. Yeah, yep. uh, and it is the biggest of the region of uh, Luberon and south of the Rhone. Wow. Yeah, so Luberon, uh, this one is in uh, 2018 vintage, which was in a uh, hot vintage as uh, usual now. Uh, and uh, we have really, um, uh, really maintained this level of acidity. This is a real success. Uh, for us, it's composed of a blend of uh, Vermontino, uh, Grenache White, uh, Clairette, and uh, Uni Blanc. Um, it's important to understand that uh, uh, the, this, this type of balance, this type of uh, complexity in terms of aromas is really due uh, to the mix, to the blend of the grapes, because each grapes gives to the final blend something uh, specific. So when we taste the grapes, it's not really easy to say that, oh, these grapes will give some uh, honey flavor. No, it's not, it doesn't work like that. But we know that we have got more acidity in claret compared to Grenache. We have got more roundness with Grenache compared to Uni Blanc. We have got more flavor as usual in Vermontino compared to Grenache. So each time, we try, due to the climate condition, to, due to the condition of the vintage, we try to manage the balance between each grapes to always have, have sorry, this type of balance that we search on the Luberon, which is really specific and really pleasant. And just to, uh, just to, to confirm that Vermentino, uh, which of course is the, really the, the Italian uh, name for the grape uh, originally is Roll uh, in French, but we, we tend to use the word Vermentino now. It's become more. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. I have spoken about the Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée. The name of the grape that we use is written on the, the, law, um, the law of the Appellation. In Luberon, this is Vermontino. The same grapes planted 100 kilometers uh, and at the west in Languedoc. This is raw. Hmm. But, but it's the same grape. It, it's the same. Not exactly, but the, the origin is the, is the same. Yeah. So now we can continue with the Ventoux. So Ventoux, Grande Reserve des Chalières. So Grande Reserve des Chalières. Um, Chalières means uh, the, the pebbles wall. And one of the particularity of uh, the Ventoux is that there was a lot of small uh, rocks wall to preserve the vineyard against the wind because the wind along the mountain of the Ventoux is very, very strong and very cold. This is a very cold wind. And this is really the particularity of uh, this region. 
Ventoux is composed in red. Uh, this is 55% of the total production of Ventoux is in red. So the red is composed of a Grenache, Syrah as usual, and a small part of Carignan. Carignan is in the, maybe one of the oldest original grape variety from the south of France, from Valley du Rhône and, uh, and Languedoc. Uh, many years ago, Carignan produced too much. So the wines was quite single. But now all the Carignan that we have are really, um, I can say, uh, with a low yield. And the level of the yield gives to the funeral wine uh, the complexity and the density. So today we can say that Carignan is a really interesting grape variety. And uh, if one day you have got the chance to, to taste in the single variety Carignan, uh, you can. This is really interesting. So Grenache, Tira, and Carignan. Yeah, Neil. Yeah, could you just give us your impressions, taste the wine and give us your impressions of the, the flavors and, and what, you're, what you're tasting, Jean-Philippe, please? Yeah, so, drinking, so... It's too early for you, maybe, sorry, but uh, next time I will share with you, it will be a pleasure. It, it's wine yeah. o'clock somewhere, Jean-Philippe. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, um, I said that uh, each grape gives to the wine uh, a particularity. This wine in Ventoux uh, is really dark. The color is really important. Normally this is due to the Syrah. The Syrah is more colored. Then uh, by the nose, we can, we, we can feel uh, the origin of the Grenache. The Grenache of the Ventoux is not the same as in Côte d'Iron, due to the wind, due to the level of the, of the acidity, due to the altitude. So the complexity is not the same. From my point of view, Ventoux is more, uh, uh, is very expressive with a, lo with a lot of, uh, of fruit, a nice complexity, but a nice a complexity more uh, um, like a plume. Plum, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it smells. Uh, it smells. Um, uh, I don't know the translation, but uh, garig. So the aroma. Uh, yes. Garig is one of those words that you see quite a lot in in, in tasting, specifically in the Rhone wines. That is very difficult to translate in a single word. But it's uh, it's the concept of of dried herbs uh, and that, um, the sort of herb de Provence. Um, and a certain dustiness as well that you can uh, you can feel if you're if any of you have been to the the southern Rhone and been walking outside on a hot summer's day where you have these these dusty fields and then you get wafts of of rosemary and thyme and uh, and other wild flowers and herbs coming across the wind that is uh, that is typically what we describe as la garrigue. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Right. Yeah. So so in the mouth we can uh, we can feel. Um, we, we, we can feel the roundness of the, of the Grenache and these uh, tannins, which, which is quite uh, uh, present in the mouth uh, due to the Syrah and uh, the Carignan. Normally, the Carignan, we say that it develops some, uh, some uh, white flavor, flavor, but due to the freshness of the appellation of Ventoux, if I can say freshness, uh, the Carignan gives something uh, more uh, uh, violet in the mouth. So we have got a nice complexity with a, an interesting um, fruity flavor, but quite easy. So this is an, uh, a perfect match for me um, for every day with uh, a lot of <laughs> different uh, issues. Okay, terrific. So before we taste the next two, I'd just like to uh, um, okay. uh, say a so few words about, uh, about the pricing of the wines as we go along for, for people looking in. Uh, I, I tend to make a very bold statement about the Rhone Valley in general, because I really do think in terms of value for money, the Rhone Valley is probably the best value wines in France and, and arguably the world. I just think, you know, you, you're never disappointed about what the Rhone wines give you. They're always very generous, very easy drinking. 
a lot of wine for not a lot of money. And Luberon Vonto, I think, probably summed this up more than uh, any other wines. Uh, they're both retail, depending on your state, uh, somewhere between $10 and $12 uh, a bottle. Um, and, you know, even the most expensive wines uh, in the Rhone Valley, you know, even the most expensive Chateau Neuf de Paps uh, cost in the hundreds of dollars and not in the thousands of dollars when you're talking about Burgundy or, or Napa Valley or, or, or Bordeaux. So terrific value wines uh, and those two in particular. Thank you. Uh, Jean-Philippe, if you'd like to move on to the Côte de Rhone. Yeah. So the, the Côte de Rhone, uh, which is called the Réserve de Bonpa, uh, which is the original uh, wine of uh, the ranch. It has been uh, the first, uh, then the rest has been developed many years ago now. Uh, we are always in the 2018 vintage. Um, so this Côte de Rhone, uh, as I said, is coming from, from uh, the quaternary terraces, so along uh, the Durance River and the Rhone River, because um, Côte de Rhone is one of the most important uh, surface of Appalachian in France, so 30,000 30, uh, hectares, uh, mm -hmm. so this is quite big, and there is a lot of difference, uh, small parcels, small uh, sub-regions, so difference in France, and to maintain the original uh, type of uh, balance of uh, expression of the wine of the Côte de of Bompa, this is why we always try to, 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 to work on, along uh, the, the Rhone River due to the type of terroir. So this one is a, is, is a blend of uh, mainly um, Grenache around uh, between 60 and 70 uh, percent with um, Syrah, uh, Mourvedre and a small part of uh, of Carignan. Uh, I have spoken about Mourvedre. Uh, Mourvedre is coming from at, uh, at first from Bandol, but now due to the changing climate, um, we, we have got some very good maturation of Mourvedre. But it's not every year. Sometimes the weather is not uh, um, hot and the maturation of the Mourvedre is not enough. So in this case, we don't use uh, Mourvedre in our blend of uh, Bomba and some, uh, some, uh, in some other years, like uh, uh, 2018, we use it on our Côte du Rhône. So, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of blending session, if I can say, the difference between Ventoux and uh, the Côte du Rhône is that uh, to have a better integration of each component, uh, we add the different grapes in the same time, in the same tank, in the Côte du Rhône. So during the harvest, we always try, try to, uh, to manage and to, to do the harvest in each uh, parcels, uh, to blend it in the same uh, tank. And at the end, we have got a good maceration because during 20, 22 days, uh, Syrah, Grenache, Carignan are in contact and uh, it develops something special uh, that we could not have if we don't do that on Côte du Rhône. In terms of uh, flavor now, another difference if we have to compare to uh, the Ventoux, I have spoken that Ventoux is more fruity, uh, Côte du Rhône is more spicy. In terms of expression by the nose, the uh, intensity, uh, we are in the same level. And this is normal because we are on the same vintage and the expression of uh, the aroma uh, is always coming uh, with uh, time. Uh, so in this case, we are more spicy with aromas of, uh, of uh, lavender, of uh, um, uh, thyme, right? Thyme. Thyme, sorry. Yes. Rosemary. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and it's not exactly the same type of flavors that we have with uh, Garrigas. Okay. So once again, uh, terrific, uh, terrific value here. Depending on your markets, uh, this wine will be retailing for somewhere between 12 uh, and $14. So once again, uh, there's a lot of wine in that glass for, uh, you know, for, for $13, $14. 
Okay. Now, Croix de Bon Pas. Uh, so the Croix de Bon Pas is a Côte d'Iron village. Um, so this is an, uh, an, uh, a blend of different grapes, but uh, of different village too. Um, the village uh, in the Croix de Bon Pas is situated between uh, Chateau Neuf du Pape and the Plan de Dieu and Vizan. The idea is always the same thing as we have with uh, Luberon and Ventoux or Côte d'Iron, is to blend a different region be because one is more uh, fresh, the other one is more hot, so better for Grenache, the freshest, more interesting for the Syrah. Uh, so in this case, we don't blend uh, the different grapes together because each grape is vinified separately depending of the village where it is coming from. And at the end, we do the blending of the different village and we do the aging. So the aging of the, of the Côte d'Iron village is uh, more longer, more long compared to the single Côte d'Iron. So now, so the difference is that the Côte d'Iron village is more, uh, um, not really, I would like to say serious, but it's not serious, it's more complex. So in terms of tasting, of appreciation, of uh, food pairing, it's not the same approach. Uh, the, the Côte du Rhône is, uh, if I can say more for an, uh, uh, Sunday at, uh, at noon, and uh, the Côte du Rhône village more during, uh, during the winter for the long uh, evening winter. I thought you were going to say the Côte d'Iron village. So Côte d'Iron is for Sunday at noon and the Côte d'Iron yeah. village is for Sunday at 12.30. Uh... Exactly. <laughs> yeah. This is... Uh, when we taste it, uh, we feel it as a uh, petit cru. It's a uh, regional appellation, Côte d'Iron village. But this wine is really an, uh, <coughs> sorry, petit cru, small cru tasting. Uh, Jean-Philippe, I have a, a question from, uh, from Mitch. Uh, I'm not sure where you're from, Mitch, but uh, thank you for, for, for coming in and uh, asking a question. And he's asking, what makes the villages of the Côte d'Iron special compared to Côte d'Iron itself? Is it, is it just soil type? What, what, what really sets apart the Côte d'Iron and the Côte d'Iron village? Yeah. So <clears throat> this is two appellations different. Into, if we can have the, the map we, uh, of the Côte d'Iron, uh, we can see that the big region is the Valley du Rhône. In the center, this is the Côte d'Iron, <clears throat> sorry. And we have got inside some uh, small uh, pink uh, circle this is some specific village. And those specific village have got their own law of production, which is different compared to the single Codron. And one of the most important difference is the level of the yield. So the level of the yield of the Codron village is uh, smaller compared to the Codron. And this is important because uh, the level of complexity, the, uh, the type of uh, aromas and the density in the mouse really depend on the level of the yield. If we have got a yield, with, a yield which is too much important, we will have an, uh, a flat wine. If the yield is lower, we will have more expression, more density, and so at the end, more pleasure. Great. So uh, Mitch was from uh, Mitch was phoning in from uh, from Philadelphia, so uh, must be working for or with our very good friends from Vintage Imports down there, which is terrific. We have a question from Steve Walker uh, from Santa Rosa, California, uh, and he was asking if you could just touch again on whether you do blend in any of the white wines like Viognier in any of our red blends. Are we using any whites uh, as they do in some places? Uh, alors, okay. 
I'm not sure to have understood all uh, <laughs> the element of the question, but uh, there is two things you will um, rectify. Uh, one thing is that Vionnier is not used in all the different appellations from the south. Okay, Vionnier, we cannot use it in Luberon, but we can use it in Côte d'Iron. The other point is that uh, there is uh, usually when we blend some white grapes into the red, this is because the white has more, more acidity compared to the red. So if we have got some black grenache with a high level of sugar, so you know, of uh, potential alcohol, normally we need to add some acidity always for the reason of the balance. And the acidity is better when it's coming from white grapes compared to an analogical uh, product. Terrific. Thank you very much. I think I've got uh, maybe another uh, question here. Yes, this is uh, this is Nicholas, uh, and I'm not sure where he's uh, he's writing in from, but he wants to know: um, Do we own any men, or are we all on uh, on, on grower contracts? Yeah, we we have got uh, so we are negotiant. We have got 50 different uh, grow, growers uh, who work with uh, with us. Uh, and uh, the, the particularity, and uh, this is a big part of our job, is uh, to maintain the relationship with this, those growers and those growers for the mo most of the part of them, they don't sell any bottles. This is some growers of uh, plants. Uh, they produce the, the, the grapes and we work, we work together to do the vinification and the blending and the aging and we do the bottling and yeah so this is a real partner uh, partnership between the growers and uh, and us terrific great so i think we have uh, uh, i think we have uh, about uh, another uh, 5 minutes or so if, if any of you uh, do have any questions just to cover the cote drone once again uh, wonderful value for, for Cote d'Iron Village. And I would encourage almost everybody, I mean, Cote d'Iron, as, as John, John Philippe says, is, is that sort of everyday uh, ubiquitous wine that goes with, uh, with a lot of things and you can really drink without any questions, asking yourselves any questions. But it's not a very big step up in price to go to Cote d'Iron Village. And I really do think that when you start getting up into Cote d'Iron Village for, for a few dollars more, you're getting such a, a terrific experience and some terrific value. So that wine typically retails between fifteen and seventeen dollars, uh, and is uh, is is absolutely uh, absolutely wonderful. Um, I don't know if we have any other questions coming in. Um, just a comment from George uh, George uh, Scorker, who's in, who says thank you for your deep chord focus session, and uh, his next magic in winemaking is co-fermenting. So he congratulates on you using your co-fermenting rather than blending, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as you mentioned. Um, question here from Brett Patterson uh, from San Francisco. Um, he wants to know, uh, can you touch a little bit on the fermenting and aging process of the wines? Um, are you using cold maceration? What are you fermenting in? How are you aging them specifically? Yeah, so... Uh when we can because it, uh, it depends of uh, which type of, uh, of wine. But if we speak about uh, the red, we have got some uh, concrete tank. So the volume each time is around, is between 100 and 200 hectoliters. Uh, it helps a lot because this type of volume corresponds to a, a, a plot, an, a, a load de par um, parcel situation. You know, yeah, location. Yeah. Location. Yeah. So uh, uh, normally we use some uh, analogical uh, yeast uh, because due to the level of the pH uh, that we have in the south of the Rhone, we need to colonize, colo yeah, colonize the, yeah. Yeah. the must uh, yeah. with the type of yeast uh, uh, to fight against uh, the Brettanomyces. 
then usually the, the maceration uh, takes uh, uh, during uh, between 18 and uh, 30 days, uh, depending of uh, the appellation and of the grapes. When we have got more stearine to the tank, uh, it's more uh, between 25 to 30 days. When we have got more Grenache, this is more around uh, 12 to 20 days. Uh, then, typically uh, in the Rhone Valley, they're using a lot of uh, concrete fermenters? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, a lot. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, this is maybe, I think this is due to the cooperative, uh, due to the cooperative from the Rhone, which has been created uh, now 80, uh, 80 years ago, which has been created in concrete tank. And due to the success of the quality of the vinification inside, um, it has been developed uh, a lot. And I prefer it compared to uh, concrete steel, uh, con uh, steel um, stainless steel. steel. Yeah. Uh, we do. So we have a, an, uh, another question. This is from, from Patrick, and he just is just asking. So for finishing in the wine, uh, are any of them aged uh, in oak barrels at all, or in oak vats? Which wines in the range are oaked, or not very much oak influence? No, 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 no. We we don't uh, we don't use we don't use too much oak uh, on the appellation from the south that we have here, because this is a region, the regional appellation, but we use some aging oak on the cru, uh, Gigondas, Vaqueras, and uh, Chateauneuf-du-Pape, because uh, we, we need, due to the level of the concentration of the cru, the level of uh, the density and the typicity of the tannins, uh, we, we need to, uh, to, do, um, to, to give to the wine and the patin, uh, to give the tannins more softer. And uh, this mm -hmm. is why we use a part of the wine in the uh, oak aging uh, to have in the phenol blend, which is not uh, too hard before the bottling. Okay, great. So I think uh, we're, we're almost to the end of our allotted time here. Just one last question, because I think a lot of people asked it is, it's almost, not entirely, but almost a specificity of the Rhone Valley that you do see so many embossed bottles. And can you tell us just a little bit about where the tradition of, of using embossed bottles in the Rhone comes from? Ha, oh, it's a good question, Neil. I think that uh, you have got the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't, I can tell them about, you can tell them about our embossed bottles. I'm not sure of the, the history is, uh, as much. Um, I, I know that traditionally the, the, uh, the tradition of putting Chateauneuf de Pape in the bottle going back in the day was to make sure that they were produced actually in Chateauneuf-de-Pape and for specific producers because there were a lot of unofficial Chateauneuf-de-Papes going around. Uh, how and why that was extended to different parts of the Rhone Valley, I'm, I'm not sure. That's for, we'll look at that and, uh, and research our history and, and, and get back to you on that one. Thanks for the question, Mitch. Yeah. Very good. So uh, I think that brings us to the end of our allotted time. Um, I know we can't hear you all on muted, so I will give a little round of applause to my good friend, Jean-Philippe. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, I did see there are some of the questions uh, on, the, on the feed, which we have noted, and we will get back to you uh, with those uh, answers uh, later this week. Um, so once again, thank you very much for joining us. and. Uh, you will have seen there are some more virtual tastings with uh, winemakers from the south of France, Burgundy, and our Bubbles King, Marcel, Com tomorrow. And we look forward to seeing you all uh, on those uh, casts as well. And just before I go, just one little shout out to David Cole, uh, uh, a gentleman from a very long way ago. My pastor just came in. He's working for our friends uh, at Lieber in New York selling the, the Bon Pau wine. So, David, nice to see you again and uh, look forward to meeting you soon. Jean-Philippe, thank you. Thank you, be safe. Very good, stay yeah. safe everybody, stay healthy and uh, look forward to seeing you out there in the market and over a glass of wine as soon as uh, this craziness is all over. Thank you, bye-bye.